Hi, in this lecture, we will discuss nutrient digestion and absorption, and we'll be focused on the chemical digestion of nutrients. When we take in food, we have these really large molecules. They're called macromolecules. We have our carbs, our proteins, and our lipids. Now remember, the goal is to take this large molecule and break it down into smaller pieces so it can be absorbed. It's either going to be absorbed in our blood or our lymph. The lumen is where the molecule is, and in order to get it in us, it has to pass through this epithelial cell layer. And so we need to have very small molecules to actually get through there. And there'll be certain ways that they're transported. So we'll come back to some of our cell membrane transport. Our carbs and our proteins, our amino acids and our sugars are going to get absorbed in our blood. When we take a fat and break it down, it's absorbed a little different and that goes in our lymph. Lymph was white because of the amount of fat in it. So it's critical that we're able to take these larger molecules and break them down so that we can absorb them and get all these nutrients to our cells so they can make ATP, make proteins, secrete, everything we need for life. So when we're taking something big and we break it down, it's called hydrolysis. And you'll see the lice at the end because what happens is we have to add water to break the food down with the enzymes. And so that's the process, it's catabolic. A while ago, there was some, I don't know, some people were saying that if you wanted to lose weight, just don't drink water because you need water to break down food. And remember, we don't break it down. If we don't absorb it, it stays inside our GI tract and it comes out in our feces. Well, that's not real bright, right? Because yeah, you'll lose weight, but you will die because you have to have water. So let's start with the carbs. When we're looking at carbohydrate digestion, we have big carbs. We have things called polysaccharides, which are basically chains of glucose, big long chains. And they come as starch, which you've probably heard of before, glycogen, and even fiber. So when we get that big long polysaccharide, it's weight, we can't absorb it, it's too big. So we have to take that polysaccharide and we have to break it down first into what's called an oligosaccharide. Now an oligosaccharide is about three to six monosaccharides, simple sugars. So it's smaller than the poly, but it's still too big to be absorbed. So then we have to take those oligos and break those down into the disaccharides. You know, di means two. My disaccharides are the lactose, maltose, and sucrose. They are still too large to be absorbed, so we have to ultimately break them down into the monosaccharides, which are galactose, glucose, and fructose. Those are what get absorbed. And so as we go through the process, I'll be introducing some enzymes to you. Um, a lot of these enzy enzymes will be on your final practical exam, and we'll talk about you know, which ones you have to know for this lecture exam and which ones we'll put on the final exam. But I'm just gonna go through with you a few of these. So when we are looking at these enzymes, we know that the first thing we have to do is take that polysaccharide and break it down. So my amylases are going to do that. It starts in the mouth with salivary amylase, and it starts the process of taking that big, long starch molecule and breaking it down into three to six monosaccharides. You know, and you should chew your food well, but food's not in your mouth a whole lot, right? It's not there very, very long. Nothing happens in the stomach. And then when it gets in the small intestine, we're going to complete our carbohydrate digestion and absorption. So the pancreatic amylase will be very important at converting all the rest of the polysaccharides to oligosaccharides. Remember the small intestine relies on enzymes from the pancreas. And then there's a lot of enzymes that actually come from the small intestine. They were called the brush border enzymes. That was the lining of the small intestine. So these brush border enzymes are gonna convert those oligosaccharides into the disaccharides. And there's one called dextrinase and one called glucoamylase. Okay, now I have my disaccharides, my lactose, maltose, and sucrose. Lactose is commonly called milk sugar. Maltose is known as malt sugar. And sucrose is table sugar. So now if we're going to break those down. Notice lactose gets broken down into galactose and glucose. 
because it's a disaccharide, it will split into two monosaccharides. Sucrose breaks down into a glucose and a fructose, and maltose is actually just two glucose molecules attached end to end. So the enzymes for these are pretty easy. Remember they end in ASE, so lactase is going to break down lactose. Sucrase would break down sucrose, and maltase would break down maltose. Now that we have those broken down and we finally have our monosaccharides, those monosaccharides are going to get absorbed. Now, when they get absorbed, they have to enter the enterocyte. They have to enter the small intestine. And so I'll just kind of draw a small intestine cell here and we'll go ahead and have a capillary. I'm not drawing the whole um, villus, but this will be my blood. Right. And the goal is to get it into my blood. So I'll just draw a couple of cells here. I'm just trying to draw some of the microvilli. And then remember this would be um, the lumen. And so when I'm moving the glucose in, or the fructose, or the galactose, um, and we're gonna keep them, we're going to treat them the same. They have to go into the cell, out the back of the cell, and then into the blood. So they have three little layers they have to pass through, phospholipid layers. So they enter the cell co-transported with sodium. So what that means is that a glucose and a sodium are gonna use the same little transporter and they're both gonna come into the cell. So we need sodium to absorb glucose, and we usually have plenty of it. Now it has to leave the back of the cell and enter the blood, and we're going to keep that simple, and we're going to say that both of these processes are going to use facilitated diffusion. Remember that facilitated diffusion requires a protein transporter, and it's passive. So then we're able to get the glucose, fructose, everything is going to go into my blood. Now, from there, all that blood, right, all this blood that's leaving my small intestine, we know it's all heading to the liver. So those veins from your small intestine are going to drain blood into your hepatic portal vein. And then it will take all that nutrient-rich blood to the liver for processing. In fact, we can only use glucose for energy. So one of the things the liver does is it converts fructose and galactose into glucose so we can use those. If we have a lot of fructose, sometimes as the liver converts it, it can also convert it into lipids. So when we look at nutrition, we will talk about high fructose corn syrup and then how bad that is as far as processing. Let's look at the proteins. Very, very similar idea. When we look at the protein, we're gonna start with the big things, which are the protein, and we're going to combine protein and polypeptides. They need to get broken down into smaller peptides but we need to get to amino acids if we're going to have any absorption occur. So when we're looking at our protein digestion, you probably remember that it starts up in the stomach. Um, in the stomach, we had pepsin. The stomach pH is what activates it from pepsinogen, and it might break up maybe 10 to 15% of the protein, so it starts it, but it's not the main location. Then it continues in the small intestine. So we need to break the big polypeptides and proteins down into peptides, and that's what pepsin and trypsin are going to do. So they're trying to get us to the peptides, and trypsin comes from the pancreas. Now we need to break down those peptides into just amino acids for absorption, so notice this comes from the brush border. And if you look at their names, amino peptidase, carboxypeptidase, yes, as peptidase, kind of tells you that it breaks down the peptide into the amino acid. The amino acids are absorbed the exact same way as glucose. So the amino acid is going to go through that epithelial cell co-transported with sodium. So we'll try to draw a couple cells here. And then we have our blood below. And so it will go into the epithelial cell, co-transported with sodium. Then it will leave the cell and enter the blood 
through facilitated diffusion. Once we have that blood, all that nutrient-rich blood is going to leave and go to the liver through the hepatic portal vein. And remember, the liver processes all protein. Lipids are a little more complicated, so I'm trying to keep it simple here. A couple things with lipids. Number one, they have to be emulsified with bile. If we don't have bile, we cannot digest lipids. And what we eat is going to stay in the lumen and go all the way through us. So an emulsifier is something that takes a big droplet of fat and it separates it into smaller droplets of fat so that the enzyme, pancreatic lipase is the one we're going to look at, can break down that fat. So we have most of the fat we eat, by the way, we eat triglycerides, um, any of your fat soluble vitamins, A, D, E, and K. Uh, we eat phospholipids. Remember, these are just found in any living thing, right? Plants, animals, triglycerides, phospholipids, cholesterol is a lipid. Now, cholesterol is only an animal product, but these are all the lipids that we take in. So when we take them in, um, they get down in our small intestine, and intestinal juice has a lot of water, so oil and water don't mix. The first step is the bile coats and separates them. Now the pancreatic lipase can work, and what it mainly does is takes that triglyceride and breaks it down into the fatty acid and the glycerol. So now we're, we've digested our fat, <coughs> excuse me. So we need the lipase from the pancreas. So now we have all these kind of fats hanging out in smaller fat clusters and fatty acids and glycerol. So the bile salts surround those fats um, they emulsify so that basically they don't separate in solution. And things called a micelle or micelle, and it, it's a transporter. It just brings all those lipids up to the cell membrane so they can enter through diffusion. Otherwise, they would separate. If you've ever mixed oil and water, you'll see it forms a separation. When we're looking at the bile, it's also, make sure you understand it's the bile salts that do this because bile had electrolytes and water and bile salts are the emulsifiers. It's kind of like when you um, wash, you need soap. Soap is an emulsifier. So we have oils on our hands. And so we were to wash our hands without soap, the oil won't mix with the water, right? The dirt's and the oil on our hands. But when we use soap, we, we rub our hands with that. That surrounds and coats those lipids and dirt on our skin and separates them. So now they can kind of mix with water and be washed away. So the micelle comes inside, it drops all that fat off inside the cell. Then all the fat you ate, gets repackaged. So we make triglycerides again. So once we come in, that little glycerol combines with the fatty acid inside the cell and any lipid you ate, vitamin A, D, E, K, cholesterol, all of that gets packaged together and it gets a little protein coating on it and we call this a chylomicron. So what we're going to have are lipoproteins. And so a lipoprotein is a bunch of fat, which I'm drawing as yellow, so a lipid, and then it has a little protein coating around the outside of it. That's why it's lipoprotein. So think of it kind of like an M&M candy. The chocolate's the fat, the candy coating's the protein. Well, lipoproteins come in different varieties. You've probably heard of some of these before. HDL, IDL, LDL, VLDL, and CM is the chylomicron. The chylomicron is the fattiest one. It has the most fat, least protein. It's very, very fatty because it's whatever you just ate, all the fat from that meal. It gets packaged as a chylomicron, and because it's so big, it leaves and it enters the lacteal. The lacteal is more permeable. So the chylomicron enters the lacteal and it travels as lymph. Now this HDL, IDL, LDL, VDL, VLDL, we're going to talk about those later when we get into the next chapter, but you might've heard of HDL. It stands for high density lipoprotein. That's the good one. And LDL is low density lipoprotein. That's the bad one. The density tells you how much protein. So if you're looking at HDL, it's gonna have a whole lot of protein with just a little bit of fat. Whereas if you're looking at LDL, it's going to have more fat and less protein. 
but the fattiest one is the chylomicron. Now it goes in our lymph. We gotta get this to our blood. We need our, our cells need lipids. It's very important for cell membranes, for energy. So it travels in our lymph until it eventually enters the blood in the subclavian vein. Now, once that chylomicron hits your bloodstream, there's an enzyme, we're not learning its name, but it actually takes the triglycerides off. So any of the triglycerides that you ate get removed and they're gonna go mainly to muscle and adipose tissue in your heart. You're gonna use that for energy. Well, if you take the triglyceride piece off, what's left over is called the chylomicron remnant. So that's like the fat soluble vitamins, the cholesterol, the phospholipids. And so that is going to go back to the liver. And then the liver is going to use that to make all the other lipoproteins. And we'll talk more about that piece of it later. So that chylomicron gets split. The triglycerides are going to go in the blood to your cells to be used to make ATP. And the remnant goes to the liver for processing. All right, clinical. So some of these diseases I'm sure you've heard of before. We have Crohn's disease. So Crohn's disease, we have what's called IBD, inflammatory bowel diseases. So there's several that fall into this category. Um, just put this little information thing in about Crohn's. Um, you know, as far as it's diagnosed, I have 20 to 30 in your notes. This one says 15 to 35. Don't get too hung up on the exact age, but it is in younger individuals. You can see they don't really know exactly what causes it. It does cause a lot of abdominal pain. You can have diarrhea, severe pain, cramping um, when you have this attack or when the Crohn's acts up. It varies. It can be very mild or it can be very, very severe. So it's unpredictable, kind of hard to know when it's going to flare up and maybe cause a bout of crampy diarrhea to hit. They um, also, like I said, don't know exactly what causes it. Uh, when we look at it, we know it's aggravated by diet and stress, possibly. We know that genetics would play a role in it as well. And they think maybe it's some kind of immune response from exposure to a virus or a bacteria. But again, there is some sort of genetic link. So they say about 20% have a relative who has this. As far as the treatment goes, um, part of it is, you know, if, if it does increase with stress, it's trying to basically find a way to um, decrease your stress level. They also know you might take an anti-inflammatory because it is an inflammatory bowel disease. So there's anti-inflammatories they can give you. And sometimes when people have a Crohn's bout where it's severe, they need to be hospitalized and where they can get IV fluids and some medication to, to decrease the cramping and relax it. Celiac disease is thought to be an autoimmune disorder. And what happens is the immune system attacks gluten. So if the person eats gluten, which is a protein found in wheat, then you get this hyperimmune response to it. So what happens is when the immune system attacks it, if we look at the, at the small intestine, here's the villus. Remember, they were nice and long and all the cells. Over time, the immune system attacks the villi and they actually get damaged and they atrophy. So now you don't have the nice villi for absorption of nutrients, and so you can have malabsorption. If you're not getting nutrients, you're, you're not going to grow. You're probably going to get sick a lot. And they also know that some other signs and symptoms, if you have celiac or some sort of gluten sensitivity, a lot of times you will get cramping and bloating. Um, it can cause joint pain as well. So I've mentioned my son before, and you can um, several times, he is the one that had epilepsy and when we removed gluten from his diet we took away wheat his seizures stopped and so no other explanation no other variable neurologist said he had a 95 percent chance of having seizures the rest of his life so you know who knows i have some gluten sensitivities i can eat it but i notice if i eat more i actually really notice joint and muscle pain in particular so, you know, if you have any of these symptoms, maybe try to remove wheat from your diet for a week or two and see if they let up a little bit. And oh, the treatment is a gluten-free diet and there's plenty of stuff you can eat that doesn't have gluten in it. And there's all sorts of stuff that they make now that tastes quite fine without the gluten. So IBS is irritable bowel syndrome. And this one is basically a combination of spasms, contractions, you can have diarrhea, 
you can have constipation. Uh, basically, the colon is just spazzing out. It's not smooth. It's not working like it should. So it takes time. It does affect more women than men. And it can cause a lot of um, problems. You know, if you're having bouts of diarrhea and intense contractions, you're probably not going to work that day, right? There is a diet. It's a FODMAP, F-O-D-M-A-P diet. You can Google that. It does seem to help a little bit with IBS. And then there's some medications you can take to kind of relax the large intestine. So these were things, this what could also be used with Crohn's disease, things that would basically block acetylcholine, right? You would want to just like slow it down um, and not make it as active. Hepatitis is a viral disease. There's several forms of hepatitis. We will focus on um, A, B, and C. When you get infected with the virus, it causes typical signs and symptoms you would expect with your liver. So you can have a fever, headache, vomiting, you'll have abdominal pain often, nausea, uh, you can get jaundice. Remember that the liver is getting rid of the um, bilirubin and that if it can't process it and get rid of it in the bile, it tends to accumulate in your skin and your hypodermis and the white of your eye, the sclera. So you can get a yellowish tinge to your skin. You can see what a healthy liver looks like here and then hepatitis attacks the liver. Now, three forms. Hep A is the one that you get from contaminated food. This is why when you go to the restaurant, there's all those lovely little signs telling if you work here, wash your hands thoroughly with soap, right? So this one is spread. It's, it's, it's micro. You're not going to see the feces. If you see feces, you shouldn't be eating there, right? But basically, if someone doesn't thoroughly wash their hands and they have hepatitis, they can transmit it that way. It can happen in water if you have areas where the water isn't treated very well. And so there is a vaccine that would be good to take because it prevents it. It's your hep A vaccine. Um, as far as the pathogenesis, again, you usually take it in through contaminated food or water. It hangs out in your liver where it replicates and causes problems. And then you actually shed the virus in your feces. So a lot of viruses are shed in fecal matter. And so that's why it's so important if you have a bowel movement, you know, make sure you wash your hands well. A lot of times it just goes away on its own. You could get immunoglobulin therapy if you needed it, but most of the time this will go away on its own. Now, hep B is a little different and that hep B comes from your blood or it's sexually transmitted. So it's not just oral fecal route. This is usually through body secretions. And there is a hep B vaccine as well to help you, you know, prevent you from getting this. I'm pretty sure you gotta have both if you're working in healthcare. This one also can be spread from mother to child. And so you, know, you get the vaccine and then hep B usually clears up. However, there are some medications for it. One is interferon therapy. Um, remember interferon is basically what helps um, decrease viruses from spreading. It inhibits the replication of the virin, virus. So there is an interferon therapy for hep B. And there's a few antiviral drugs. Now, hep C is the really bad one. Hep C also spread usually through blood transfusions, um, sexually transmitted, could be spread through IV needles. Um, this one is the one that is chronic and it can really affect your liver. It can, it can cause liver failure for this. This one does not have a vaccine. Um, it's a, it's, you know, it can be a pretty nasty form of hepatitis to have. So, you know, Previously, it was like you were just kind of stuck with it. There wasn't a whole lot they could do. There were a few antivirals. Um, and unfortunately, you know, people died from cirrhosis and liver failure from hep C. But what's kind of cool in the last couple of years is they actually have a cure for it. This is, you're not memorizing the drugs, but they've actually found there's a bunch of new antiviral meds that have been produced. And these actually help cure. Look at the cure rate for hep C. And a shout out to my brother. He um, had a woodchuck business, believe it or not, woodchuck groundhogs. And he supplied their serum because apparently their liver is just like a human liver. So there was a lot of research done on his animals that found this cure um, for hepatitis C. So, you know, who would know that we thank the woodchuck for a uh, cure for hep C. I put this one in, it might be helpful to you as far as treatment. Again, hep A usually goes away on its own. Um, hep B 
should go away with rest, but if you need antivirals, they have them. And then hep C, we're looking at these new antiviral meds that hopefully can cure it. But notice, you know, you're on them for a while, um, a couple months. And then there's something called fatty liver disease. And fatty liver disease is something where the liver processes everything, right? All our sugars, all our proteins. So if you're eating like a high sugar diet, when those sugars go to the liver, the liver converts them, right? Takes the carbs, converts it into glycogen, but then it takes excess sugar and glucose and it converts it into fat especially fructose. They know that high fructose corn syrup often gets converted to fat faster. So it's something you might wanna avoid. But in the liver converts it to fat, a lot of it gets stored in the liver. And so the liver slowly changes and it starts to get replaced with this fatty tissue. So you, know, you have a healthy liver and then you have your fatty liver. Now it's called non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. There is an alcoholic version, which cirrhosis, we'll look at shortly. But the biggest issue with this is obesity. So the best thing you can do if you're having a fatty liver disease is to lose weight. Because it's, as you lose weight, it really affects your liver even more. So you know, one pound of weight loss is like a, a five to tenfold loss of liver fat. So it'd be important to try to lose some weight because that will help with this fatty liver. And the issue is over time, it really does damage your liver and it interferes with liver function. And then cirrhosis is the one we think about with like chronic alcoholism. It can also develop from an untreated hep B or hep C infection. And you can see that, you know, slowly the liver changes, you know, even fatty liver can ultimately lead to cirrhosis where the liver is going to fail. You can't live without a liver. So your treatment at that point is a new liver. And you can see how many different systems, right? It affects because the liver makes all the plasma proteins. So we're going to have issues with our albumin levels, our edema, we're going to see jaundice, and we mentioned ascites already. And so that can happen from cirrhosis. And then as we get older, just, you know, everything slows down. So our epithelial tissue is more susceptible to damage. They don't replace it as, as fast. Peristalsis gets weaker, so you might have you know trouble maintaining normal bowel movements, digesting food. Depending on your diet, if you're drinking alcohol a lot, you know over time that starts to accumulate. And we know that colon cancer and stomach cancer go up with age. You can get colon cancer screening tests, very easy to do, and you can also go in and have a procedure for them to um, you know go in and look at it. So it's called a colonoscopy. Um, smoking increases every cancer, but particularly, you know, mouth cancer, oral and pharyngeal. And then as we get older, we actually start to lose our sense of smell. And if we lose our sense of smell, we lose our sense of taste. And then that causes problems because, you know, everything you eat is kind of like bland oatmeal. You're not going to be that excited to eat dinner. And so you might not be eating well. And so we really worry more in the elderly that they're getting proper nutrition. So this wraps up our last lecture on the digestive system.